Did anyone feel the earthquake during the week? Anyone feel the earthquake? I had no idea about it. I read about it on Facebook in the morning. I was like, oh, an earthquake, cool. Apparently it was a big one. Uh, our world is shaking and perhaps more often than it used to. I don't know. Did there used to be a lot of earthquakes? There are right now. Um, so if you felt that shake, then maybe that, that's a little bit of a sign of what's going on in our world. And, and as we've been thinking about this last section of Hebrews, we've been thinking about this unshakable kingdom, this unshakable hope that we have because of what God has done. I mean, what uh, Sienna just read for us before, verses 20 and 21 are what you could call a benediction. A benediction. Ever heard someone say that word and wonder what they're on about? It's one of those words that can easily become Christianese because it's rarely said outside of the church. And sometimes we can just throw it around like everyone knows what we mean when we say, oh, the benediction. Yeah, I know what it means. So what is a benediction? Sadly, it has nothing to do with eggs, Benedict or Benedict Cumberbatch, although I would love it to. But it doesn't have anything to do with those things. Basically, it's a blessing. It's a blessing. As you leave, as you go, it's a prayer asking God to be with you and God be for you and at work in you and for you. Benedictions have always been part of the worship of God's people. And often we'll end our services together with with a benediction or a blessing, often by simply reading a verse from Scripture. Other times with a word of encouragement as we go out, into the week. And when we leave this place tonight, we don't want to just scatter. No, we want to be sent to be reminded of the God who is with us and the God who is for us. And that's what a benediction does. And here in Hebrews, it appears at the end of the sermon slash letter that we have been reading. And at the end of this word of exhortation, as the writer calls it, It almost feels like it could be a later addition, and and it could well have been added as this word became a letter to the church. However it came about, it is a wonderful way to finish. It's theologically rich. It's relationally warm. It expresses great hope and encouragement for the church. What more? What more could we want for one another, then that peace would rule our hearts and minds, that grace would be the air that we breathe, that we would have everything good for doing God's will, and that he would work in us something pleasing to him, something that brings glory to Jesus. What more could we hope for? As followers of Christ, what more could we ask for than that? So as we look at these last few verses, I want to dig into that richness. I want to share the encouragements that are there. And also call us to live lives worthy of the God that we glorify. And as we do that, I'm going to be using some lines from the songs that we're singing tonight. Some we've already sung, others that we will soon. I want to do that because I want to highlight the beauty of the truths that we sing each week as we dwell in the word richly together. So verse 20 says, Now may the God of peace, peace we sing, bring it all to peace. I don't know about you, but I long for peace. A peace in my mind because there's so many thoughts and dreams and hopes racing around. Peace in my heart amongst the conflicting emotions and desires. Peace in my soul for those feelings of guilt and shame. For that unease that you just can't shake. Peace in our world. Peace in our nation, peace in our relationships. We want that peace. So, so what is the God of peace doing? Well, it's a mistake to try and define peace as an absence. Like you, you take away war and then you get peace. Or you take away sorrow and then you get wholeness. You take away conflict and you get unity. No, peace isn't absence. Peace is about 
presence. A reconciling presence. God brings things together. In Hebrew, the word peace is about wholeness and well-being. So much more than a, a feeling of tranquility. In Greek, peace is about unity and harmony. Togetherness. So much more than just being quiet and calm. Now, it's more likely that the Greek idea of togetherness is in view here, in mind here. But either way, peace is a broad, holistic image in the Bible. So what is the God of peace doing? The God of peace is working through conflict and separation. Through disagreement and disconnection. He's working to bring about unity and harmony for the church and for the individual. A peace that breaks through, a peace that breaks into, a peace that overcomes and reconciles. Because peace is about togetherness, not emptiness. Our God is the God of, pre- of peace. And so we pray, peace, bring it all to peace. All our storms, all our struggles, all our frustrations, all our fears. We bring them before the God of peace. God who is on the throne, God who is in control, unseen but unshakable. We stand firm and secure because of God's sovereignty, not our strength. And so how does the God of peace bring about peace? Well, through the blood of the eternal covenant. The blood of the eternal covenant. After the sermon, we'll sing these words, Precious blood has left me forgiven. Precious blood has left me forgiven. Now, in Hebrews, this is the 23rd time that the word blood has been mentioned. And that, that is a lot. 23rd time the word blood is there. Here's just a couple of the references. In chapter 9, verse 12, it says, He, which is Jesus, did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood thus obtaining eternal redemption. Then just a a few verses later in verse 22, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And from last week, chapter 13, verse 12, so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Jesus' blood, his sacrifice, brings about redemption and forgiveness and holiness set free from slavery to sin and set apart to live for righteousness. Precious blood has left me forgiven, pure like the whitest of snow, powerful to make sin and shame retreat. This covenant, this covenant is making me whole. The songwriters get it. The songwriters get it. The blood has power. And the covenant promise, God's unwavering commitment to his people, it makes us whole. It brings about peace. Hebrews 13, 20, then, is the 20th reference to the word covenant in the book. It's another key idea. In chapter 8, verse 6, Sums it up nicely in what, in what the whole book talks about. It says, But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs, to the priests, as the covenant of which he is the mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. This covenant is better than the old one. And not in the way a new phone is better than the old one. There's no marketing spin here. There's no special feature reveal. The guy in a skivvy or something similar. No, it's not like my phone is better than yours. That's not the idea here. It's that God has done something truly new. 
the new covenant, the better one, it writes the law on our hearts. It opens the way for reconciled relationships. It offers us full forgiveness. Do you know that offer of full forgiveness? Have you taken hold of it? Or are you holding on to guilt and shame? Do you know that offer of forgiveness? Jesus offers full and forever forgiveness. It's the eternal covenant. An eternal promise. It's, it's unending, unshakable. It lasts. Why does it last? It lasts because Jesus lives. Earlier we sang this line. We sang, death is broken. He is alive. Death is broken. He is alive. Death could not hold Jesus down. The God of peace, the writer of Hebrews says, brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus. Jesus has been the the focus of this whole letter, and, and yet this is the first explicit mention of the resurrection, a concept that was so pivotal to the preaching of the early church and, and to the letters of Paul, but it has so far gone unnoticed. And it's not that it isn't there, it's just that it's sitting under the surface. And in part, It's because Hebrews skips right over it. Hebrews goes from the cross to the throne. From Jesus shedding his blood to seated at the right hand of God. This is chapter 1 verse 3. It says, after he had provided purification for sins, after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Or in chapter 12, verse 2, it says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And time and time and again, the, pe- the preacher quotes or references Psalm 110 with this same image every time of Jesus exalted and enthroned. So the resurrection becomes a, a kind of assumed knowledge. I remember when I was applying for uni courses or or trying to choose the subjects in my degree, and there was some things that were prerequisites. You had to have studied this subject before moving on to the next one. And then there were other times that there was just assumed knowledge. They were going to teach new things on the basis that you had already knew the things before, whether or not you knew them at all. Assumed knowledge. And now some might say that to assume makes an ass out of you and me. Let's go on, think about it. Think about writing it down. You and me. Anyway, but in the context of Hebrews, this is not an assumption that doesn't make sense. It makes perfect sense here. Of course, Jesus is risen. Of course he is risen. He's not just resurrected, but he's exalted. He's risen and now he reigns forever. He's reigning forever, so he must have risen. But that's not all. He's also a priest forever. Hebrews makes it clear that Jesus' ministry is ongoing. He's still working. This is in chapter 7, verse 23. It says, Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Again, the resurrection is assumed. Jesus is still saving, still interceding. He he speaks on our behalf. And it's because he lives that our life is possible. He is still our king. He's still our priest. And and still, as the writer adds, he's still the great shepherd of the sheep. Now, I don't have a perfect line from a song for this point, although we do have quite a few songs that refer to God as shepherd. But this line from All Glory Be to Christ is fitting. 
It says, Behold, our God shall live with us and be our steadfast light, and we shall ere his people be. We shall ere his people be. All glory be to Christ. The Jesus who, who leads and guides and protects his people, Jesus who walks with us, well, he is the shepherd. We are his people. We are his sheep. It picks up on a, a long line of Old Testament imagery, particularly in the prophets, in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. They all express this longing for a leader, one who would care for and protect the people, to care for them and to guide them. As Duncan spoke about last week, Hebrews 13 draws attention to the church's earthly leaders. Have confidence in your leaders, it says, and submit to their authority because they keep watch. They keep watch over you as those who must give an account. You'll notice that language. They keep watch. They keep watch like a shepherd. But ultimately, they must give an account. They have to give an account to the great shepherd. Earthly leaders come and go. Pastors come and go. Shepherds come and go. And while they're here, while they're here, their job is to point to the great shepherd. That's who we follow. Ultimately, I'm just a sheep like you. So do we trust in the great shepherd? Do we rely on him? Do we follow him? Do we obey him? Do we shelter in him? Rest in him? It's our culture, it values the individual. It tells us to make ourselves. And so often we long for that independence, to, that we would make our own way. We want to be self-sufficient, self-reliant. We never actually outgrow our sheep-like need of a shepherd. Yes, we're more than sheep. We're the children of God, but, but we're still sheep. Still sheep in need of the great shepherd. What does the great shepherd do for us? Many things, but Hebrews 13 highlights two things that really boil down to one thing. He will, we read in verse 21, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him. And let's take a closer look at the first half. Equip you with everything good for doing his will. As we sung earlier, let your kingdom come, let your will be done. Let your will be done. That's the chorus from, from the new song that we sang earlier. If you were wondering, was that song new? I didn't know the words. Yeah, it was new. The words are taken from Jesus' instruction on how to pray. To pray that God's will will be done. It's the doing of God's will that's the focus. The doing of God's will. Not in memorizing it or trying to recite it, but in doing it. And we're going to talk about that so much more in the book of James that we're going to be starting next week. But the faith has to be lived out. God's will has to be done. So how do we do it? Well, we're equipped, we're told, with everything good. Not everything that we think is good. And not everything we need for fame or success, not, not everything we need for beauty or wealth, not everything that we need for our plans, our dreams, our desires, but, but everything we need to do His will. To do His will. And it says that we will be equipped, and this is the third time that that word has been used in Hebrews. The first is in chapter 10, verse 5, where, where a sacrifice is prepared. That's the word equipped there. A sacrifice is prepared. It's, it's shaped. It's, it's put together. It's made. 
The second time is in chapter 11, verse 3, where the universe is formed. That's that word equipped again. The universe is formed by the word of God. It's shaped, it's put together, it's made. The wonderful blessing of this section is that God is preparing us. He's forming us with everything good. Everything good so that we can do His will. If God calls you to do something, then and He's saying that He will make the way. He might call you to mission on the other side of the world. Or on the other side of the street. He might call you to faithfulness in a season of struggle. He might call you to joy in the face of sorrow. He might call you to peace in the storm. He will equip you. He will make the way. He will form you for the task. He will prepare you for the test. And so the preacher of Hebrews continues, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him. How do we please God? How do we please him? Well, not by earning or striving. Should nothing of our efforts stand, no legacy survive unless the Lord does raise the house. In vain its builders strive. Unless the Lord does raise the house. So how do we please God? The writer's already told us. Back in chapter 11, it says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. If faith is what the ancients are commended for, faith is what we are called to. Faith is doing God's will. We think and we feel and we act in ways that please God. And the beauty of it is, the beauty of it is that God works in us. Did you see that? That as we work, He works in us what is pleasing to Him. In fact, do and work are the same Greek word. This passage literally reads that you may do His will. Him doing in you, in us, that which is pleasing in His sight. You may do His will, Him doing in us, that which is pleasing in His sight. So although Hebrews 13, 21 could sound like two things, it's really just one. We are equipped by Him, it is paralleled by the fact that He is working in us. And what is pleasing to Him is doing His will. Sounds a lot like one of my favorite verses, Philippians 2, 12 to 13. It says, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Continue to work out your salvation, for it is God who works in you. We work it out because God is working it in us, not our efforts. God is working, and and so we can work in our doing while He is doing. The benediction ends with a doxology. It's another good word, isn't it? It's just a word of praise. Through Jesus Christ, to to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. It could be glory to the God of peace or glory to the great shepherd. But in the context of the rest of Hebrews, where the sun has been so central, it makes sense to see this as a hymn of praise to Jesus. Glory forever and ever. And so we sing all glory be to Christ our King. All glory be to Christ. His rule and reign will ever sing all glory be to Christ. His name is exalted, his rule celebrated, his word obeyed, his beauty adored, his character honored, his deeds praised. 
we see Jesus and we respond in worship. John Piper, in a sermon on this passage, he sums it up really well. He says, we get the care and he gets the tribute as the shepherd caregiver. We get the protection. He gets the honor as the shepherd protector. We get the guidance. He gets the esteem as the shepherd guide. We get the provision. He gets the trust as the shepherd provider. We get the joy of being loved like this. He gets the glory. We get the joy. He gets the glory. Now, after the, the richness and depth of verses 20 to 21, verses 22 to 25, I feel a bit like a bit of housekeeping. And it's kind of like comparing the announcements section of our service to, to the songs of worship. Just a little bit of housekeeping in there. But as is often the case with the writings in the New Testament, it ends with some personal notes. But firstly, to the brothers and sisters. Not a word that's used much in, in the book of Hebrews, but brothers and sisters. For the church family, it says to bear with this word of exhortation, to, to take it seriously, hearing its warnings and its encouragements, to bear with it. Bear with it because we're told, in fact, I have written to you quite briefly. It could have been longer. It could have been longer. There's always more to say. In fact, this sermon has been quite brief. It could have been longer. It could have been. This is actually the 30th and final sermon that we've done in this series in Hebrews. It could have been longer. What we've said is quite brief. In verse 23, it it shows how personal this, this writing is. They long, the writer longs to be with Timothy and, and they want to be with the church. They write, I will come to see you. I will come to see you. Just as he asked them to pray for that in verse 19 that we looked at last week, that he would be able to come and see them. It's not some outsider who's just lecturing them. He's one of them. And then verse 24 is a series of greetings. It's, it's a way of showing hospitality to acknowledge the other person. And then the final words. Verse 25, grace be with you all. Grace be with you all. It's a common farewell. It's repeated in Romans, in 1 and 2 Corinthians, in Galatians, in Titus. But it's not an empty cliché. It's not a stale convention. I'll just chuck that on the end. You know, grace be with you all sounds good. No, the final word is grace. Unending, unstoppable, unshakable grace. As everything else fades, grace remains. Because God remains. To the church of the first century, who is caught up in old traditions and, and facing real trials. To the church of the first century, Hebrews was a call to confidently cling to Christ. To us, to the church of today, what would it say to us? When it feels like everything is shaken. Our culture is changing, our our society is swaying in the breeze. Hebrews reminds us that our hope is unshakable. And so we keep on. We keep on fixing our eyes on Jesus. He is unchanging and his kingdom cannot be shaken. He is unchanging. His kingdom cannot be shaken and his praise is unending. To him be glory. How long? forever and ever. We look to Him. And Hebrews has shown us so much of, of who Jesus is. He is the final word that God has spoken. He is the radiance of God's glory. He is better than angels, better than Moses, a better priest, a better covenant, a better temple, a better sacrifice. 
He's the pioneer and perfecter of faith. He is the same yesterday and today and forever. He is the great shepherd of the sheep. Through him, we're told, we approach the God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Through him, we draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith, faith brings. Through him, we throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Through him, we run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Because we have this unshakable hope. We have this Jesus as an anchor for the soul. Firm and secure. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what you have done for us. We thank you for this beautiful picture of Jesus. That we would see him more clearly. That we give him the glory that he deserves. And Lord, would we be unshakable? No matter what's going on in our world, what's going on around us, Lord, would we hold on to you? God, we want to see you lifted up in our lives, in our hearts. And so, God, we ask for you to be at work in us as you promise you will be, that you'll be working in us what is pleasing to you. And so God, in these songs that we're about to sing, the prayers we're going to pray, and as we share a meal together, as we go out into the world, will we be eyes fixed on Jesus? Have our eyes fixed on Jesus. Have our hearts set on him. And be changed by who he is. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.